Hello and welcome to the Ask the Industry podcast, episode 123. I'm comedian Simon Kane, and this is the podcast where I interview the most influential people from the worlds of stand-up, comedy, radio and today, artist management. Jacob Howe Douglas is the founder of HD Management, a boutique agency that has a focus on film, TV, radio and online content for all of its acts. Jacob has been an agent for more than 12 years, building the careers of comedians and I was super excited to get him on. He's as hard working as they come. I love that how much he loves comedy and how much that really exudes from him as a person whenever you get the chance to spend any time with him that isn't at a gig. He's such a driven individual and he has such an honest and upfront and unique approach to management and the industry. If you're interested in hearing what it's like to be a DIY agent who started their own agency from scratch instead of sticking with an established player who has built a really diverse roster from the ground up, this is the pod for you. I'm not going to say too much more, I just want to get straight into it, but I'm doing the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. Um, you should know that by now if you listen to any other episode, as I've put a plug in it for most episodes. And if you're listening to this at the uh, time of release, I'm probably on the train up to Edinburgh right now. I think that's I think that's right. Here's the show details. I'd really appreciate it if you came. I'm on at 8.35 p.m. in the Grass Market at Apex Hotel. The show is called Every Room Becomes a Panic Room When You Overthink Enough. There is a link in the show notes. Tickets are £5. If you'd like to come and support me, I would massively appreciate seeing you there. Do come say hi. Hi. Like it's great to meet people who listen to the podcast. Um, it, yeah, I just love doing that. Otherwise, the download figure is just an arbitrary number, and it's no fun for anyone. That's all I'm going to say on that. I'll do a little bit more later in the pod. But uh, for now, if you're new here, please don't forget to hit that subscribe button. If you're old here, please don't forget to give us an honest, ideally positive review in iTunes. Five stars would be the best, but if not, a four star that reads like a five star is just as good. Either way. Please do join the Facebook group. It's called RC Industry Podcast, and it's on Facebook, obviously. But for now, so let's what dive I into do the podcast. And what I don't do as yeah. an agent. Um, I made it quite clear when I set up the agency I was not going to do um, circuit booking. It's just the way the circuits change so much, and the accessibility of acts finding their own gigs nowadays. It's just not worth my time. So what I look after: um, TV, radio, film, any broadcast. Um, as well as live in terms of corporates and festivals, but not circuit. It's just, it's just not worth my time or them losing any money out of the small amount that they get for gigs. So, but you, you've worked before on acts with the live circuit. So, is it a case of, or am I wrong about that? Uh, the previous couple of agencies, no, I never actually got involved with booking. Okay. Um, I just wonder what changed on the live circuit that made you think, well, actually, they can just deal with that themselves. I'll do the rest of it. The professional comedians and bookers feed on Facebook where the gigs are advertised and indeed some of the gigs that I um, book I will put gigs out on there and advertise but in fact I don't even deal with any bookers anymore for the gigs that I run I the, the acts come direct okay that's interesting yeah because a, a lot of acts just say you don't need an agent now for live work but then there are some that still specialize some in it. still do yeah. And I, yeah there are a couple of agents that I work with for live work um, but I just won't get involved in that mm. And you know, and you run your own agency. Mm-hmm. And what was the reason for starting that? I'd been working at a previous agency, and that had come to an end. It wasn't a right fit for myself or the previous agency. And it was a case of, do I now go and work for another agency? And I had meetings with several much larger agencies and some offers. And I thought, I could go and do this. I could take people with me. It's not really what I want to do. I don't want to be four years, five years down the line thinking, I wonder what it would have been like if I hadn't have come in here and I'd set up on my own. And I had people going, are you going in? Are you going in? We'll come. And in the end, I thought, no, I'm going to set up on my own. I walked away with no clients. I literally, it was a Jerry Maguire moment. And I thought, okay, let's do this. And I hit the ground running. And um, it's been the most challenging, but rewarding four years. What, what was the first day like then for you, like after, after setting up? What, what, what do you do? Like, how did you scout for your first act? So that moment of um, deciding, no, I'm going to set up on my own. It wasn't just a case of going, I need acts. It's, I need a website. I need to limit a company. I need to register for VAT. I need to buy a new laptop. It was everything. And I, there was no one there to help. It was, you are on your own. Mm. And I then rang around a couple of people that I knew hadn't got agents um i'm always out anyway so i know who's about and who's looking and um you know i was saying right i'm on my own do you want to come on board this is the deal the agency has built on the back of a lot of recommendation 
to be honest. As in acts saying as you're good? As in acts recommending two other acts. Uh, yeah, I can contest that. I, I, I think I, when I first spoke to you, well, I said two, two of my friends have said you're really good at what you do. Thank and, you. Uh, I mean, they kept it vague, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but they, yeah. they, no, they, they were very, very positive about what you do and, and how you've been progressing their careers and putting them forward for things and stuff. So uh, I, I'm aware of that firsthand. Um, and I think that's... I wouldn't say it's a rarity, but it's like one of only a few agents that I've had that happen to. Yes. So like in my experience, generally speaking, acts will go uh, like because because with someone like PBJ or Avalon, most of those acts are sort of in, on, on a completely other circuit to most of the other acts yes. that are coming from like 90-10 kind of thing. So as a result, you don't really hear what those agents are doing mm. whereas with the acts that you're dealing with um intermittently they'll they'll do certain different level gigs and so they'll come into contact with a lot more acts and then there's uh more there's more community spirit behind them and there's more people who they could talk to sure yeah yeah is that, is that fair? yeah, yeah that's very fair um <laughs> i think from from the starting point of setting up the agency there was never anybody paying my salary mm. if those acts didn't work <laughs> i didn't earn yeah so that was the motivation and the determination to make each and everybody who I've got have a path. I, I set a plan, um, a 12 month plan. It doesn't always work. <laughs> yeah. You go, well, we start off on that plan, but that hasn't happened and that hasn't happened. So we go, okay, well, that hasn't happened, but this is another way into this particular route. Everybody's different and that's a clear way for myself and my my acts to work too. So, so, you, so you help them make a 12 month plan or you yeah. have a 12 month plan in your career for them I to sit be. down with them and okay. I discuss what we want to achieve. What do you want to do? Where are we going? What, what are the main goals that we've got to achieve to so, get where you want to go? So Believe it or not, not everybody wants TV. <laughs> well, no, you know, uh, uh, some people just want to be known in Europe or yeah, whatever it is. And Increasingly, I've seen that. A lot of acts going, I wouldn't mind doing a panel show, but I don't really want to do stand-up live because it burns my material too quickly or something like that. Does that as well. Yeah. yeah. So, so it, is, it is kind of a, a bit of a... And also, there's, it's a different skill set that you know you're going to be bad at from the start. Like, you don't really get... I mean, you get tryout spots for panel shows and things, yeah. but you don't, you don't really get as much time to practice it as you would do on the circuit. No. So you're immediately going to put yourself out there in front of a lot more people to be bad. Yes. And I can understand why that's not necessarily appealing to everyone. No, quite. Yeah. yeah. And so, so who works for who? Do you work for them? They work for you? What, what's the dynamic? I work for them. If they didn't come to me, if they didn't sign with me, I'd have no clients. They are, I'm in a position where they are going, there are so many agents out there. I've had offers from this one, this one, this one. Why should I come to you? And as I said, nobody's paying me. I will work with you. I'm completely accessible. I, as I'm just telling you, I've been out <laughs> for the last week and all of this week, every night with work. There is no time for my own self or social if the acts message me i'm they all have my number they whatsapp me all the time and there are some things that i go can you put that in an email because this is going to get lost in our trail yep. but i think you could ask every one of them now how long do you wait for jacob to get back to you and they'll go i don't wait he answers yeah. immediately yeah i i think it, it's interesting because a lot of a lot of uh, the the dynamic is a relationship, so it's a communication thing. Yeah, between it's, every it totally is. It is yeah. a relationship. Yeah, and if you're not getting on, there's just no point. Yeah, I don't lock anybody into a contract. It's, it's <laughs> like if we're not working together, then there's no point being together. It's yeah. just not. It's so, not the way I want to work. So, what are you looking for? Like, are you looking for star quality? Are you looking for? Uh, are, are there like uh, gaps in the industry that you're going? I'd love to get someone to fill that because I think I could get them. What we? What's what's your thing? Okay, so I never walk into a like tonight. I'm judging competition for Chortle. I don't have preconceptions of what I'm looking for or what I need to fill on my books that I'm missing. If I see somebody and it, it's it's a feeling. I just get a feeling and I go that that's interesting that's different and i've got to have as i said to you i've got to have a vision and a plan for them i've had people come to me who are already established who are already earning not happy with a particular agent and i've or maybe not have an agent and it's a case of me going yeah i really like you i think well, great i've seen you so many times but i don't know what to do with you i and i have to believe in them and i have to have a plan for them otherwise there's no point i'm wasting their time and mine it, it did. It, I've had an agent say that to me, and originally I thought they're bullshitting. Like, they're you know, not. I, I, no, 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 genuinely. <laughs> well, they might have been. But, well, they, might, they might have been, and if they're listening, I now know. No, but no, but you, you. I feel like 
that's hard not to take personally for an act. If you say, I, I need a plan for you. But then I, I had a meeting with an agent who once said, what do you do? And I said, I'm funny. And they went, and? Yes. And I was like, was well, it not enough? And they were like, not in it, no. no. Every, there's loads of people who are funny. And it was a real light, but it was like two years ago, but it's like a real light bulb moment to go, oh, I can't just be funny. Because a lot of people are funny. Like it's not it's not enough. Yeah. So that's why I always ask like what what's the what's the quality? Especially if you're if you're if your main area is T V and radio, it feels like there's certain characteristics and traits and especially with quotas and that sort of thing coming in that you that you would be looking for, that there would be on your checklist at least. I think that's interesting. I I've got somebody at the moment who's chasing me and this person would tick a lot of boxes for TV and the way things are at the moment, but he doesn't tick one for me. <laughs> oh, so just not funny and to I you. just can't I just don't have a, a vision for this person and I, I I it's not fair to take them on. So they so even if they are and they, this person probably will work and probably will make money, but I'm not passionate about them. And I, 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 there are certain things that I will say. So with when I sign somebody, it's a case of, as I said, do I have a vision for them? Am I excited by them? Would I pay to see them myself? If I'm not going to pay, mm. I can't expect anybody else to be yeah. interested in them. Completely. And I think the showcase that I held here for industry um, here at the Bill Murray uh, back in April, the second one we've done now, the feedback was this is a really strong roster of acts. Every one of them is different and individually their material is, is exciting and that excites me. Completely. So let's let's do this then. So let's say you tonight you see an act that you think them yeah let, run me through the process of how long does it take to sign them what what do you do you email them do you, do you wait for them what's what's that like for you um yeah i mean I, I i i would normally just have a quick word with them afterwards so how much i enjoyed the set find out where they're at how much material they've got at the moment because it's all very well signing somebody with 10 minutes material but yeah realistically <laughs> it's gonna take a while before we get you know further down the line in, and and start getting paid work the flip side of that is i have been lucky with two people that i've signed who are currently on the books both through competitions and the it is a case of nurturing at the moment but what's fascinated me is they've already been booked for certain things mm. <laughs> one for an overseas festival uh, quite a big one with utrecht and then um and I, I could talk openly it's um and the other one who i picked up on the back of the um, bbc new comedy award last year which is william stone he didn't win oh, i love will uh yeah he, he didn't really win and i just thought no it's this guy. He's writing is clever. Mm -hmm. His character is totally unique. He's got a really good He's vibe. got a great yeah. presence and his turnover of material, which I've subsequently found, is just, it's so solid. It's mm. so strong. And he's a great guy to work with. And I spoke to him and he did his research and said, yeah, I've spoke to people and actually, you know, I'd like to come with you. You, you do a lot and you, you're, <laughs> you're a nice guy. So I keep being told. <laughs> he's doing really well and he's just filmed his first BBC Quickie, which he's written himself and has uh, he's acting in. He's now been asked to write for a, a very big name comedian for a panel show. Can't say which one, but they do use them. That's okay. um, and that's great. You know, that's and that is the route for. I mean, that's he's getting recognised already as somebody who has solid material. And this is he's been going a matter of a couple of years or so. Mm. So it does happen. To pick them up that early in a panel. Uh, sorry, in a competition and um, and nurture. I think what. The difference with my agency is because I've got nobody above me going, hey, it's the end of the month, he's earned no money. I don't have that pressure. I can sit on them for two years if I'm nurturing them. I don't mind. It's my time. If I believe in them, I know something will pay off. So there's I, no pressure on them to, to work. I, it's it, I wanted them to get it right. And I have stopped people debuting. I've said, no, not yet. It's too soon. Hmm. We've got to, you've got to be, because you get that one shot and it's really important they are ready. Uh, yeah, I screwed that up. <laughs> no, I did. I, we I, 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 I went up uh, without a pro. Like, I, I had an, I had sixty minutes of jokes, but it wasn't a show. Yeah. And and I emailed the award and said, please don't come. And they came the first day, and there were only two other people in the room. And I was like, oh, okay. Well, I can feel my Edinburgh being shit now. There we go. Um, so yeah, uh, there's a lesson for anyone. Don't don't go up too early. And if you do, don't don't. Yeah. Hope they don't come on the first day. I can only <laughs> advise if they choose. To not listen that's up to them but yeah. i'm there to advise and manage and you know put on the right path what what's your stock take on competitions then like are there ones you take more seriously less seriously are there ones that you will always go to what, what what's your relationship with those i mean the chortle one is great because it's is it a student it's a student one. student one yes yeah, sorry okay um no, steve will love it if we name it it's funny. yeah <laughs> <laughs> love chortle student yeah. comedy award yeah um and the bbc one is great as well what fascinates me is 
though the who gets through and you think that's really interesting that they've they never go from see i'm a big music uh, comedy fan people know that okay. that's why i signed john long from the back of the musical comedy I awards know, harriet yeah. brain yeah. as well um Do you have kate lucas or have I no no i work with kate a lot yeah. actually just on gigs oh, um cool, and yeah. bbc comedy just don't seem to include the bbc comedy awards sorry don't seem to include musical comedians i mm. and it you know john can't get through harriet can't get through and it's like ah <laughs> so whoever's on the judging panel just doesn't like musical comedy yeah. it's like but it's a great platform for um for them to be seen there's there are a lot of competitions out there but what i say to the acts is do you know what do it whatever it is go forward for the competition if you've got the time because it's 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 nurturing and working on your material it's exposing you to that pressure of performing on the spot in front of judges i don't see them as a bad thing at all i really don't and you know it, it's just great experience oh no I, I didn't think you see them as a bad thing i just wondered if there were ones that you will always look at say for example the results of or if there are ones that yeah that one there less are too mercury many, there are too many competitions there are a ways. lot yeah. there are and yeah i think that's possibly the reason sponsorship has slipped in in years i mean lester mercury is another great one which alistair beckett king one um oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. ABK. Yeah. yeah so that one bbc comedy chortle i think they're the main three i think at the moment and laughing horse um, and what do you what do you do in terms of social media scouting? Are you watching people on Twitter? You know, that's Facebook? interesting. Yeah, I have actually. Chortle's great because they always put up the um, the, the uh, contestants forever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. 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 Twitter what are they up to mm. and where they're at and it's a good way of checking if they've got an agent before you put your foot in it because mm. I'm not in the business of poaching if a neck wants to come to me then that's if they've explored every option then that's fine but um, yeah it, I uh, social media is it's a <laughs> double edged sword I find what do you mean as in like um, it can be misleading or how I scout in terms of I will use uh, social media particularly YouTube because Chortle put up the contestants the next day and that's a great tool for you to see who's been who's gone through and who hasn't and sometimes the ones who haven't are quite interesting as well you go mm. well yeah but yeah it's, it's um I'm not on social media all day long because I, I haven't got time <laughs> yeah. got an agency to run and but it's uh, definitely definitely has led to work by people clocking a tweet that somebody has written mm. and then got in touch so you never know you never know what can come from have you got a favorite social media favorite social media well i'm not personally on facebook anymore i took myself off okay um too many political rantings uh <laughs> um I, I but instagram like I, I really like instagram really? and i think i do okay. and i think the insta story i think acts can really promote themselves using that twitter is a constant feed mm. constant constant tw feed and if you don't happen to switch on at that particular mm -hmm. point you will miss something it's very uh, yeah twitter's uh, interesting but instagram the visual i think says so much more than a tweet and it lets you see who that comedian is and you can build a you can build a following by instagram as has been proved by the the, the vloggers out there and i think from the from the well from what m the feed i have i think comedians could make a lot more out of instagram uh, yeah that's why that was interesting to me because I think most people immediately jump on Twitter. Um, I think most people think they need a Facebook page. I've repeatedly told a lot of people that you're better off with a group than a page. Yes. And yes. I, I've been on Twitter for about part of eight years now, and and I get a lot of work from it. So I that's the reason why I stay on it. If I I think if I if I didn't get work from it as much as I do, I probably would have left it by now. Not because there's not people on there that support me and stuff. It's just I, I sometimes it's it's a bit much mm. some days, especially some of the trend. Like I don't get involved. A lot of people get involved uh, in like you said political rants and and topics and things. And I do, and I and I won't not say how I feel, but some. Sometimes you you know you, you forget that there's a potential three billion people on this platform that might not agree with you yeah. who don't hold back and you never know <laughs> when that one tweet or that one comment that you make comes back to bite you down the line without you even realizing mm. and you think the, I didn't know it it's happened didn't to it? so many yeah. exactly who, and, who they uh, go oh your 2010 tweet was racist or something yes. and you go maybe maybe it was maybe it was at, uh, in a different you know th I remember seeing one the other day I can't remember who it was it was an American comedian I hadn't heard of but he was like regular on circuit out there. And they took one tweet and then he tweeted a screenshot of like nine, nine tweets in a row. And they said, well, if you take that one, because there was no Fred's then. He was like, if you take that one, it is racist. But if you take it in the context of the nine others, exactly. then, then it makes sense. And I was reading all of them and I was like, yeah, this is now him just making it. It was like when Barack Obama used the N word on that podcast. Yes. They, they took it out of context and went, he said the word. Yeah. And you're like, well, I think, first of all, he's allowed. And second <laughs> of all, you don't take it out of context.
context because context yeah. is too important and Twitter doesn't allow it. No, <laughs> no quite. So, so I get what you mean by that, definitely. But I've, I, I'm not a fan of Instagram, so I, I avoid it. All. Oh, okay. So that's interesting to me. Um, and on demand players and TV, mm. you, you obviously specialise in that area. How are you? How are you finding that's impacting your acts and maybe, like we said, burning material, but also how they're having to write material because people might not watch it there and then. They might binge watch it, all that sort of. I'm all for iPlayer and and things like that. I think it's the way we watch, as you know, the way we watch TV now has totally changed. If it wasn't for iPlayer, then, I mean, with the new show that we've got at the moment, Ghosts, I mean, the ratings in week one for that were 5.1 million because that was combined with the overnights Mm. and, uh, you know, iPlayer as well. We wouldn't have that if iPlayer wasn't there because people Mm. would, I mean, I think they opened with 2.6 million, but the total for week one, yeah, yeah, 2.6, and they maintain that week two, but the total for week one, that's down to iPlayer. Mm. And I, I think it's a great thing and what about netflix i'm always on it <laughs> you're always on netflix yeah absolutely okay. whenever i get home after a gig i need to just watch something before i switch off and go to bed i yeah i watch so much i'm waiting for new things to come out at the moment uh, yeah I've, I've explored everything i leave it on in the background but i don't like a lot of it Do you know oh. what i mean like it's there but it's like it's just it's just washing over me like jazz like it's not really uh no i'm uh, oh you're a big fan yeah of okay What's, what's your favourite programme on Netflix? I don't have a favourite. There's so many things that I, I've watched. What was the um, last thing you binged? Um, I'm binging at the moment. I'm watching Undercover, which is a real-life drama series about one of the biggest drug dealers in Europe. Oh, OK. Yeah, and two undercover police who infiltrate. I recommend it to my dad. My dad just yeah. watched the whole thing about Pablo Escobar. Oh, there you go. And, and, he'll love it. And so he's, he will yeah, love it. he's all over that. So I was, get, I was going to ask how often you go and see live comedy, but I feel like <laughs> I should ask, do you ever take a day off? Like, is uh, <laughs> yeah. Don't tend to take dates to gigs when they ask. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, I mean, this is always a busy time now leading up to Edinburgh yeah. with previews and competitions. It's great because you, you just see, and obviously I book a lot of gigs as well, so you can see what acts are still talking about and you think, oh, they haven't really written much since the last time and that's interesting. But no, I, I'm I'm still excited by live comedy. I wouldn't do it otherwise. Yeah, of course. Yeah, it's, um, and this is such a great place to come and watch as well. The, the Bill Murray. Bill Murray, yeah. Into, yeah. Uh, shameless plug because they've been really nice and outside of room. <laughs> I'm a fan um, member, so. I'm a man- Oh, same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, lo- I love that work. Well, let's let's move on to Edinburgh and your relationship mm. with the Fringe. I assume it will change year by year depending on what acts you're taking up and what their goals are. But what's your personal relationship with the Fringe? Um, <laughs> my personal relationship with the Fringe. I think Edinburgh has changed so much over the last four years even. Production companies don't send their staff up for as long as they used to. I think that it's very difficult to pin down people to get them along to see shows very difficult and you I, I know that's not just myself it's you know the other agents that I speak to and it's a case of let us know when they're in London you're like they're in London all year <laughs> yeah uh, just but, not August <laughs> just not August <laughs> yeah. it's it's difficult and uh, that is why I, I, I ran the showcase earlier this year so mm. we can say right these ones who you like they're all going up to Edinburgh and I'm already getting people coming to me now saying industry coming to me saying hey we're not actually going up this year can we come and see a late preview which is really interesting I think Edinburgh is a great tool for acts to work towards writing new material and turning over but I think the well obviously the days of winning the well, we are going back in the past winning the Perrier and getting your stage show in London and a TV show way gone it takes a long time now to get producers to trust you as an act and to you know give you spots and to build up to something it's it's not game it was before so how has that impacted your first of all expectation management for acts but also your target setting for what they're gonna or for what they could achieve better than acts still think that or expect you to be bringing people in all the time while you're up there and you have to set the reality of listen I can only do so much and you, you have a case as well where comps are put aside and people don't turn up because because that, you know, they get pulled into something else or, you know, some, something happens back in London. You never know. I very much say to the acts, listen, don't go there with winning an award in mind. Just don't even think about the judges. I, I really, I, I get frustrated with them. I think when they start going, are the award judges in? Just concentrate on the show. Mm. Concentrate on the show. Do the best show you can. I'll do my bit in terms of trying to get in whoever I possibly can, whoever's going up. And if it, if it matches the times match, great. We'll get them in. But on the back of Edinburgh, we have a plan 
plan of we're going here, top secret, or we're going back to the Bill Murray, we're going to do your show here, and I'll push for London industry to be there then. By then, the reviews are out. We can say this is what they've achieved here. We sold out throughout August. Indeed, with Chris McCausland last year, with his show, he'd not been back for six years, and he took a brand new show back, Speaky Blinder, which we're on tour with now. Just recorded Would I Lie to You? And we've got other things in the pipeline, and that has all come on the back of Edinburgh last year, but not so much people going to see him in Edinburgh, just from the reviews and me pushing and them seeing him doing the gigs and the show here. So I still think it's a great, great festival. Costs far too much <laughs> for everyone. There's no difference I don't see anymore between paid venues and the free fringe. I, industry, they go all over, as do the reviewers. So what? So why would you... Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. No, go on. Why would you put a... Aside from maybe the room suits the show better, but why would you put an act in... Or, or does this ever factor in for you? Why would you put an act in a paid venue versus a free venue if you were going to have that debate depends who the act is depends what show they're doing if they're debuting if they're debuting i'm very much let's do it properly let's get your promoter let's do pr let's get a paid venue and let's i mean john long's debuting this year and we're in a paid venue i think free fringe if you've got the money obviously because it costs so much money but i just think you've got one chance at debuting let's put everything into it and make it you know and that's what i said to you before earlier about i will advise not to go (laughs) if it's too soon or they haven't got the money Mm -hmm. the last thing you want to be doing stressing about money up there when there's enough to worry about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just write off any money I spend on it. I hope I get back, but I, I just write it off. I go, it's it. If it comes back, it comes back. But it'll probably take a year for it to yeah uh, for me to pay it off. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and then we're doing it all again. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> oh, don't let me think about that right now. Um, no, I, I got an email from a festival in 2020, literally this morning, and I was like, "Oh no, why are you preparing <laughs> oh, this no. early?" <laughs> no, it feels like let's a, do this know. one first. Yeah, let's get this one out of the way. So, okay, let, let's talk about your role in terms of show production. So, how many? So, let's say let, you can pick any actor uh, of your yeah. roster you want, but let's say Act A is going to Edinburgh. They've got their targets. You've set that between you, and they're going to do let's say 10 previews between now and Edinburgh. Yeah. We're, we're in May. Yeah. For, for the reference of any listener right so it's yes. two months ahead how many of those 10 would you try and go to would you want to go to all of them uh, how many of those are you how, how early do you need to get a producer because obviously they're going to have their things tied up by this point in the year at least so yeah. what, what's the process for you right so all of the promoters working with my acts were signed off by February this year okay. and PR I think pretty much the same in terms of previews I was counting today, I've got eight clients this year who are going up. In terms of previews, if I can't make a preview, I ask them to record it and send it me. I'll, either in the car I'll listen to it as I'm driving or watch it not in the car not driving not <laughs> driving um, but I, I will I'm, I'm really invested in where the material's going and what where we've started off and where we're you know, along the lines I think I am quite hands on I'm not a director by any means but I have a good instinct I believe to say I don't think that that section there is working I think we should swap that round with this particular bit whatever it is sometimes I'm right sometimes I'm wrong and if mm. you know it's as I said it, it's a partnership with the acts and they're very open to doing that and working and going they want my feedback it's important and if I don't know where the show is and what it's all about and you know what's happening it's hard for me to sell that <laughs> and to talk about it is that partly so there's two questions there actually one have you performed comedy before no okay no just I, the way you were talking this I is terrifying you might enough <laughs> okay fine <laughs> Just for reference of the listener, we're on our own in a room. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. And I've made sure I asked everyone else to leave. Um, so, um, but there's, uh, no, it's just the way you were talking. I thought you might have maybe done one gig. No, I actually trained as an actor years, oh, years okay. ago. Oh, okay, okay. Um, years ago. And uh, <laughs> so I think I've got a good understanding of scripts, yeah. text, uh, characters, which is why I love William Stone last year. I got mm. it immediately. I think that that's... That's helped a lot, actually. Mm. And I can see from material what would work as a short or what could be developed into a sitcom. That was going to be There's, my next question. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm always talking to the acts about that. And one of the, you know, I'm always asking them, have you any new material? What are we changing the set? What are we talking about now? Uh, only this week, again, I've been talking about that today, sorry, Monday, with a couple of the acts. Oh, yeah, I've got new material. I'm going to record it for you. And they want me to be involved in that to see mm. because they know I, I will look at that and go, where can we go with this? What can we do? I, th- I think a new dream, if you like, that's come up from Fleabag in particular is you, someone will come to your show and see how it could be adapted for TV. Um, and I think that's a, that's a big thing that a lot of, uh, especially for Edinburgh, because I 
feel like a lot of people who spend their hours make it a bit more like you know it's not as punchy but it's still you know what i mean there's a bit more breathing space a bit more narrative driven stuff up there so so i i wondered given your tv focus whether you're looking where maybe not trying to push it that way because you don't maybe want to overpower their artistic creation but you're watching it going i know which channel would like this or i know who would cut this up into yeah when i set up the agency one of the things i said to myself was i don't just want straight stand up it's too difficult there's not enough opportunities there are far too many comedians <laughs> no disrespect but well, i want me, acts who can <laughs> i want acts who can kind of. do the stand up <laughs> i want acts who can obviously perform stand up very well but can write can act because the more opportunity the more sorry the more strings to their bow the better for me so i think out of the acts at the moment that i've got i think we've got about five or six development deals on on the table and that's scripts and that's with big production companies Mm. and then there's other actual channels not production companies but channels who are coming this week to see certain clients because the material I've said this will work as a short or a quickie whatever it is you've got to find other opportunities and not every act can act thankfully I think all of mine can I've been told what? but yeah you've got to it's 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 too difficult to just keep ringing up Mock the Week and keep ringing up Live at the Apollo. You know, there's got to be other avenues, and there are. Yeah, and some of those panel shows, I don't think it's a conspiracy or any kind of whatever. I think some of those panel shows, they are owned by a production company who are owned by an agency yeah. who are going to favour their own acts. It, it may, you know, I, I could sit here and complain about that if I wanted to, but then if I was one of their acts, I bloody wouldn't be. So, you know, uh, it's yeah. one of those things where people can moan about you've, it, but the minute you're back in the, you're in the club, you're not going to say a word, are you? Yeah, but yeah. you've just, but I'm, I'm really... I'm very passionate about them finding their own opportunities in terms of if they've got an idea for a script, I say, let's let's look at it. Let's And also, if they've got the money, which is where I was going with this, and it doesn't have to cost a lot, film something, mm. film it. Let's not just submit a script. Let's film a, a taster, which we've done before and got a development deal because it's easier for them to sit there over their lunch break or during the day and click on that and go, oh, this mm -hmm. is interesting. Oh, and a script. Let's read the script as well, see if it matches what we've got on, on, on camera here. Yeah, no, definitely. I, I, a big thing that frustrates me a lot is the lack I mean I think it's a bigger thing in America but the lack of DIY ethic in this country I, yeah. I, I think a lot of people see social media as sort of an addition to them doing stuff and I, I don't think it should be anymore no. at all it all links I'm quite glad that a lot of people thanks to this have started their own podcasts and, and I'm more than happy to help anyone I don't want to say that too many times but <laughs> I'm more than happy to help most people out uh, yeah. you know start theirs and stuff because I, I think uh, A you need to know how much work goes into something because if, it, if it's just you on this you know imagine what it's like when you've got a crew and you've got the other people to report to and stuff it's a lot more work yeah. I think people think when you've got a team it gets easier mm. and and I, I have a friend who I won't name because I don't know if they want naming but they've just signed with a really big agent and they said it's so much more work now because they've got three people I have to talk to every time I want to book a gig they don't do their live either yeah. so, so every time they want to book a gig they've got to they've got to tell them oh by the way that evening's now yeah. booked and then they go oh but hang on we were trying to get you yeah. something here and yeah. it's it's a whole I see how many how many people work for you how many people are in the agency is it just you it's just me it's just you okay <laughs> I am doing everything still I'm actually dreading taking on anybody <laughs> I don't know I'm, I, I am taking on somebody later this year on the account side because that's getting too much now so mm. I can have that sorted but I don't want to I'm not trying to grow an Avalon not interested I'm not I want to rem I want all of my acts work and being known for being consistently strong solid acts I'm you know if I can achieve that then I'm I'm happy it's a good it's a good what's the word company motto yeah yeah, I don't want a hundred stuff. <laughs> no, I don't blame you. No, I, I, I know small boutique agencies that do very well, and and they don't want to be because it's a bit like um, I was talking to Brighton Fringe about you know for this podcast, and they were saying we don't want to be Edinburgh, no. like because you, not every not everywhere can no, be, and, no. and and you've got there's a lot of virtues to being small. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. And mm. the position I'm in, I mean, the agency will grow, but not as I said, not to the extent of Avalon. Interview me in ten years and see where we're at. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll hold you to that. At the moment, <laughs> I I know exactly where they are I know what they're doing I know who they are I know where we are at with material I know what the goals mm -hmm. are for each and every one of them mm -hmm. rattle them off now and I think the obviously the bigger you get the, you you can't be across yeah. everything I speak to the acts I, I, I'll give an example I signed somebody last year who came to me from a very big agency saying I don't get to speak to my agent and I said what do you mean and they said <laughs> I said how often do you speak to your agent and they went well once every three and I went weeks and he went no months if it's days went, I'd be upset what? Yeah. I, I don't think a week goes by that I haven't spoke to every one of them mm. it's it's so important yeah it's so important yeah 
No, I completely agree. Although, so although you don't specialise in the live circuit, you do run live nights. Yeah, I run live yeah. comedy nights. I had a residency at the hospital club. So and private, private members club. Yeah, yeah, in Covent Garden, yeah. which I ran for many years. My first gig I set up in was in 2006 mm. uh, for fun uh, because I had no idea that I'd end up doing this one day. And back then, I had people like Gary Delaney, Russell Howard, Alan Carr came down. I think Rod might have done it, Rod Gilbert. And all of them back then didn't have agents or were just mm. starting out. Gosh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Trick there. Again. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I had no idea that I would end up doing this. Um, I was working in the music industry and in the event management side of things um, working with music artists to not know I'd end up in comedy but I, I, I feel like from an outsider point of view it, it's because you like musical comedy and you were working music mm. it does seem like a very linear you know what I mean yeah 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 there's a promoter that I work with a lot and uh, we share a lot of passion about music as well <laughs> mm. yeah okay should we look after music acts as well I go, no it's too hard <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is hard but no that's really hard oh definitely definitely yeah I was going to ask why you started that night whether it's for scouting whether it's for uh, whether because it's a private members club that limits who you can book yeah. and who you couldn't book or the no, no. Actually, I mean, I had some really great names, and it was a it was a lovely venue. The difficulty was actually the club itself, just having too many events on, and just couldn't promote everything at the same time. So I'm actually starting a new night. I'm working with a very big theatre in central London and programming comedy during their dark nights, which will be starting in October. Don't name it on here; you'll get a million emails. <laughs> That's um, why I stopped talking. Yeah. <laughs> it uh, will become apparent. Moving on, branded content. Mm. Um, I that was that was an interesting thing for me because. As we were talking downstairs, my, my day job is writing things for brands yeah. and things like that. So you do branded communication, as you put it. Yeah. Yeah. That came about, as I said, I don't just, they don't, a lot of the acts I have are capable of writing not just their own material. They can write. And it seemed a silly route not to be looking at when brands come knocking on the door going, oh, can so-and-so be in this? And we go, yeah, but you know, they can also write this. Oh, so we mm. don't need to pay a copyright. No. <laughs> this month. No, you know, we can do it for less, but it's still going to cost. But, yeah. you know, and it would be, it makes it more personal. It makes it more mm. relevant to the advert, actually. And it, it's a really interesting area I just did a pod with uh, Griff Reese Jones yeah. um, who started out in radio advertising and he did a similar thing yeah, where yeah. he was like uh, so I'm just saying you're in good company oh. <laughs> um, he, yeah he, he, he said well originally when he started writing them he didn't know how much to charge for them and he said we ended up undercharging for them and we nearly went bust even though we won all the awards <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, so he learned very quickly yeah. that you could charge more yes. um, but yeah it's, it's really interesting because I think uh, and we're talking about that a lot David Schneider's uh, social media agency I think, I think again it comes back to uh, the DIY why ethic the the knowing that there's attention attention is the most important thing mm. in this current climate and with everyone's attention being on social media why would you not yeah. want to get on that yeah yeah so so what kind of st i mean because there's a lot of people that would say you do adverts you sell out for example with comedians what what kind of have you ever got any sort of negativity in that way or has that ever impacted an act no i've never experienced that to be honest i think most acts are quite happy to take the money <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, you can get some really big paying adverts and happy days. Uh, there's not so much, but um, I think that, I mean, for example, Chris McCausland with his advert for Barclays, Barclays talking cash points. I mean, he was very clever in that he, um, I mean, that was great exposure, but they also let him write the copy for that himself. So the first thing he says was, hello, my name's Chris McCausland. I'm a comedian and I'm on blind. And that's before he even got on to talking about their brand and yeah, their yeah, product. Yeah. And they let that go. <laughs> so yeah. that's the first thing you heard when that advert went out and that ran I think for over a year in, on TV and in cinemas um, so he completely used that for his own mm. purpose and um, got paid <laughs> yeah he did indeed <laughs> But no, I, I'm, I'm all for clients working on adverts completely. And, and there's quite a lot of named comedians out there who, mm. who do them as well and get paid very well. So if you find the advert, mm. you get a commission. If they find an advert, do you still get a commission? How does that work? Yeah, I mean, anything. Yeah, there's, uh, yeah, anything that goes is broadcast. I mean, it's the thing is what, what acts, and I'm not talking about anybody specifically, but acts, and I've been there myself as, a, as an act and having an agent going, well, I found this myself. And it's like, yeah, but you can't have an agent and expect them to do work all the time then you're not getting work and then you get something and them not to work with you on that it's um that's you know you you can't pick and choose which bits of the agent relationship you you want thankfully i don't tend to get that very often and you will occasionally get somebody who really does dig their feet 
into the ground and go, no, no, no. And do you know, life's too short and I can't be bothered. <laughs> and I go, fine, I'm not going to put in the work then. We'll go our separate ways because it's just not worth my time or yours. And I think those kind of people will always, no matter what you get for them, will always find a reason not to pay. <laughs> mm. And I don't need it. Yeah, no, I, I can see it from both sides. And I feel like from what you just said, you can as well. Yeah. You know, if, if someone, if I had an agent and I got approached by a place, there's part of me that would go, well, they've approached me and not my, you know, whatever. Uh, they've got my brand in mind or whatever. But then how much of your work has made my brand appeal to them? Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, and you can never put, you can't quantify that. Um, no. And, you know, because a, a, a producer of somebody walks into the, the, the pub and sees you doing a gig, well, <laughs> you know, that's chance, it's luck, you know. Mm. And at the end of the day, if you want to put together the contract and do the, the work, then fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally, totally. Because that's the hard part. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so TV stuff. You were, you were talking about Ghosts, the TV mm. uh, show, and you were telling me that you you co-produce that with uh, NRH Management. And I wondered if no, 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 no. The six acts. Okay. Um, Martha, who I obviously look after, mm -hmm. and then Larry, Ben, Jim, Simon. There's six in total. Yeah. Um, <laughs> who have I missed out? Matt. Um, six agents mm -hmm. work together very much because the guys create their own work. Mm -hmm. They go, we've got this. So us as a six work and have conference calls to discuss mm -hmm. You know what, what, we're, what we're doing with it. Mm. Yeah, I was going to ask first of all where you see yourself positioned in relation to other agents, and B what your relationship is like with other agents. Because so far you've been very nice, and you've even said things like, "Oh, I don't, I don't poach other acts." And there are agents that sometimes do that, and yep. obviously there's a honour amongst thieves that you shouldn't necessarily yep. do that. So I wondered w where you see yourself p fitting in, and and what your relationships like with other agencies. Um, maybe not necessarily in a business sense, like do you socialise with other agents just for, you know like no. Okay, fine, <laughs> fine. <laughs> nah. There's a couple of good um, relationships I've got there with agents who I can pick up the phone and go, you know what, I've got this situation, what do you think? Not naming a client specifically, but a, and they'll do the same to me. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges working on your own. You can't turn around and ask mm -hmm. anybody. Um, and it's good to get advice from others. And it's a bit of a support network. Remind me of the other question. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, well, I was going to le lead on from there into, um, so we were talking about uh, co-producing shows, um, working with other agents and where your agency is positioned in relation to other agencies. Okay, so the last question then. Sorry, I did throw too many at you in one go. It's all right. I, I had a little mind me. blank as well. Was that what? No, it's completely on me. Um, I got too excited. It's my fault. When, um, okay, so where I'm at versus or compared to other agencies, I, I'm coming up. I know I've got a solid list and that's, as I said, been proved with the showcase recently and I've had to do that. I've had to put myself on the line and the axe on the line and go, we're doing a showcase. Who knows who will turn up? And we were full this April again. That's the second one I've ever done. And you have to do that because we're not united. We're not off the curb. And TV is notoriously risk averse. Know that. Bookers, not all of them, but there are a large portion out there who won't look elsewhere. They will always go to the big, the big agencies. And by putting on a night saying, come down, have a couple of free drinks. <laughs> come and see who we've got. And it will be a tight evening of six minutes each. And the feedback is, oh, wow. Who's that? Hadn't seen them before. Can we see a full hour? Can we see this? Yeah. And as a result from April, a lot's moved forwards. But I wouldn't have been in a position to do that in year one or year two. The agency was still growing. I am still being approached by other acts. I can't take everybody on. I'd like to. I want to help, but I just can't. And I'm in a position at the moment where I'm like, the next year, I think, is going to be quite significant in terms of what happens with, with certain people. So who, who do you invite? to those events I mean because I assume production you... companies commissioners okay yep because I assume you want general public in there as well not many 20 oh, okay 20 the rest are all industry okay which was great yeah um, so just a, a nice layer of laughs at the front and then yeah that's what I'm thinking because <laughs> yeah. in my experience of industry they sit there analysing it rather than sort of laughing at and it. they do yeah. um, but oh, actually they thing. come out and the feedback and I'd love to show you they're you know, going great night really tightly ran and everybody without fail was absolutely superb Mm. And they go, we go to a lot of these and some really do drag on and some aren't that great. And I'm really pleased that I'm getting that feedback. Mm. It's, I've worked hard to, you know, put this together and, you know, build this. So I don't know fully the back catalogue of all your acts. So forgive Shame. me if they have, sorry. <laughs> I know some of them are very, very well as friends, but I just don't know okay. every one of them. So if you got one of them on something like Live at the Apollo or... or, or Chris McCausland did it. Like that. Okay. Yeah. What does that now offer for their career in the positives and the negatives well chris is a really interesting point in case now you've brought that up he's 
the first blind professional comedian that was out there. There are a couple of others now, I believe. But he was certainly the first blind one to do Live at the Apollo. In the two years, he filmed it in the... When did he film it? The September 2017, and it went out in the January 2018. What was quite shocking was that on the back of that despite him having an absolutely superb gig and I was there on the night he got 10 applause breaks in his set I mean it was incredible the feedback from the commissioners and in fact open mic was what great job really strong we didn't get any offers of panel shows on the back of that not radio not TV we have just filmed would I lie to you last week for with Chris and there is now this turning point where there's an article coming out that I'm aware of and I've been in with a couple of commissioners recently where they're going we are focusing more on disabled talent because we are aware that we've kind of left them behind versus our BAME policy mm -hmm. or you know that's come from them that's not me that's come from them now I I'm all for that I think that's a fair assessment of the situation I'm all for yeah. that my frustration has been I don't want him on because he's blind I want him on because he's a bloody good comedian who happens to be blind and that's when he filmed last week, would I lie to you, it was all about how solid he was on that panel mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. could hold his own against the three biggest names in comedy at the moment, probably, on mm -hmm. panel shows. They want him back on, and it's like, it was not about him being blind. Mm -hmm. It was about, he is bloody good. What? And the question then is, what else is he doing? What other panel shows is he on? He must be on this, he must be on that. Mm -hmm. And you go, no. I'm hoping now this will turn and open a few doors because he deserves to be seen. He really does. Well, isn't this podcast going well? I think we're all having a lovely time. I want to quickly apologise for using that beep beep noise as my marker that I'm going to jump straight into a middle bit of this podcast. A few people have tweeted me and told me that their headphones, their wireless headphones, low battery alarm noise is the same. So... I'm sorry about that. I'm continuing to use it. I'm going to find a new noise. But at this stage, I'm just unpacking for Edinburgh and I don't have time to find another one. So apologies for that. Hopefully after Edinburgh, that will be resolved. Thank you for letting me know. I'd rather know and, you know, sort of work a way around it. Um, uh, I, I'm loving this. There are so many thoughts on the TV industry and Edinburgh. And, and I love that he's just got no boss. And so he just gets to make his own work. And I think so many comedians do that. And I think we don't think of agents in that way. So this has been really fun to put together an edit. And there's still like half an hour left. How exciting. I'm, I'm having a great time putting this one together. I really am. But you know what comes next. Here comes a mid-roll advert. And we're back. Uh, right, here is my plug for my Edinburgh show. I'm doing the Edinburgh Fringe. The show is called Every Room Becomes a Panel. I, <laughs> I like that I've written in my notes. Um, the show is called Every Room, etc, etc, etc. That's that's how bored I am of saying it. Pro tip for anyone listening to this who is going to be doing an Edinburgh show either this year or whenever. Don't pick a title that's ludicrously long. Because you get fed up of typing it and you also get fed up of saying it. So... It's called Every Room Becomes a Panic Room When You Overthink Enough. It's at the Sweet Venues Grass Market at 8.35pm. Uh, if you want to come and support me, there's a link in the description. And if you can't come, could you share it on social media? Tag me in it. I'm at This Made Me Cool. I'll thank you for sharing it. Everyone who tweets it, I thank for sharing it. And um, as long as you tag me, I'm, I'm regularly searching for it though. But uh, yeah, just any and all help would be massively appreciated. I mean, yeah, you know the drill by now. Just go and buy it. Actually, I'm going to give you five seconds of silence so you can go and buy a ticket, okay? Now. Did you buy a ticket? You, I mean, you can't really buy a ticket in five seconds, but you should be partway through uh, buying it about now. So that's... um. It's really kind of you. Thank you very much. Don't don't stop buying a ticket just because the podcast started up again. You can just keep buying it because I'm only going to ramble for a couple more seconds anyway. So um, thank you very much for buying a ticket. And for those who just skipped ahead and didn't buy a ticket, thanks. I really appreciate the support. Let's jump back into the podcast. I think... I mean, I just read a book that was talking about quotas. Mm. Uh, where well, it wasn't just about quotas. I had a whole chapter on it. And it was talking about how largely they have a positive impact for a very short amount of time. And then they start to have a negative impact because people start to go, well, they're only there because of that reason. Yes, I or, would agree with that. Or, or even worse, uh, people go, well, I, I now have one less opportunity because of this you know, because it's not a meritocracy. Now, realistically, no area of this industry is as much of a meritocracy as we'd all like, if we're completely honest about yeah. it. Um, but I do know what you mean, and I find that really... Because I wouldn't... I remember when I first started getting paid work for certain promoters, I didn't tell them I could drive, because I didn't want to get booked as the driving act. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I didn't yeah. want... 
I didn't want to be known as the act who could drive other acts who were further along. Yeah. And it meant that it cost me more because I drive <laughs> on my own yeah. and it would annoy some acts because they'd go, but I thought we'd get a lift together. And I'm like, but I don't, do you know what I mean? So I understand that sort of. Mm. I'm never going to be able to fully understand, you know what I mean? So how does, do you, have you asked him, how does he feel about being booked on the basis of a... Well, I don't know. Zeppotron have been extremely accommodating and they want they um they watched his live at the Apollo clip and the producer rang me and said we'd love him on. Very very funny guy. There was no as accommodating as they were, there was no impact negatively on him being on that show. It didn't upset the format of the show. In fact, it actually enhanced it and made what is a blooming really funny show even funnier because of the disability. And he's so open to discussing it, taking the piss out of himself, you know, won't say too much because it's going to be a great episode when it comes out. Mm. As numerous people said, this will open a lot of doors for him. But your, but your concern is the doors are open because he's disabled? Yeah. Um, I can understand that worry, yeah. Well, I think there's going to be a turn. I think that there is going to be a turn at the moment with industry that they go, oh, we need to do this but in the same breath I kind of think well if it means him getting on and means improving himself and he's mm. not just there because he's blind that he can actually do it mm. fine if that's what it takes to prove that he's not there as a token and he can do it because he's got the talent then let's put him on because it, it feels like and I don't know who, who said you know, we're, yeah. we're trying to... Because the way that's phrased as well, it doesn't sound like they're they're doing it because it's in vogue. Or, for example, because Lee Ridley uh, passed, you know, they're looking at disabled communities or anything like that. Mm. It doesn't feel like they're doing it for that reason. It feels like they're actually noticing that they've overlooked Yeah, absolutely. People. And that's that's reasonable because I think that has happened in certain yes. areas. There's a lot of white men out there. Yeah. Like, you know what I'm yeah. saying? And, I, and as one, yeah. I'm aware of that. But I, but I, I know what you mean because every person I know on the circuit says take whatever you know like if someone says like if you so if your show has like a i don't know if, if it's called uh, uh egyptian policies in the west you know if anyone says oh you're now the egyptian comedian go with it because yeah. you know at least you've got your niche and you've got and you're not just funny do you yeah. know what i mean you're that thing but if it's a disability then i can understand why maybe you don't necessarily want you don't want it negatively associated mm. yeah and so it's a, i think that's a unique position and a, that'll be an interesting yes. tightrope to walk as yeah. it were yeah and so uh, yeah I'll go, I'll go back to my question so you've asked them about it and they they're just do they have a problem with that sort of questioning of them saying we want to bring more disabled acts on Ask or him, sorry chris himself chris doesn't have a problem with it okay fine. no 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 okay. no i mean he's like mate have you spoke to this one and spoke, and I'm okay, like, oh yeah yeah we're, okay. we're working on it yeah no i wonder what his opinion on it was and no, he's not here to talk of himself but, no he's um, he's no he's really he's identified which shows he would would be would excel in or mm. on rather sorry he's he's identified which shows he would be more suitable to than others there are certain formats that just won't work for him mm. because of the disability but it would be um it would be good to see more doors opening how frustrating is it from your perspective if for example you've you've got an act you've nurtured them for a couple of years tv comes knocking and they go uh, either they go i don't want tv or i don't want it yet like how do you how do you reconcile that's happened with that? that's yeah. happened with a client a couple of years ago and i was actually fully supportive of that okay i thought it was the right thing to do at the time and that this client needed to take another year develop the material and then we're ready okay that's Are happened you, and i mean even like yeah that's that's happened yeah because i can imagine it being frustrating because obviously it's extra lovely work and it moves them up and stuff but also uh it is their career ultimately yeah. and so yeah i just wondered how you would deal with that in a hypothetical but if you've already dealt with it there's no hypothetical at all. no it's it wasn't an issue as i said there's nobody breathing down my neck saying this client needs to make that money <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm if they're not happy then that's I, i'll support that what do you think makes a good agent i think communication i think listening to your client work having the same goals as your client um there's no point going in one direction if they're going hang on no no that's not where i want to go yeah, yeah. <laughs> no do celebrity jungle um <laughs> no <laughs> i think just don't be an ass <laughs> you know just just i i reply to everybody who emails me if i can't take them on i go i'm really sorry and i'll explain why and mm. You know, people are actually quite grateful to getting feedback mm. and going, oh, I understand. You know, I'd, it's nothing personal. It's I just don't think there's... Um, it's, it's, life's too short and too hard as it is to make things any more difficult for yourself. What are red flags that uh, an act should look out for when they are being approached by an agent? Ooh, hang on, give me a minute because I'm, I'm sure I've got some stories for you there. It's okay. <laughs> 
just so you're about to ask you the reverse as well what are your red flags when someone's approaching you so if you if you want to ask them their way around if that's easier let's go that way first i think a couple of things there looking at their past history of how many agents they've had in an over what time period <laughs> is normally a good uh, good good warning flag i think realistic goals versus unrealistic goals i think some acts especially coming off the back of the competitions can be like <laughs> i expect to be on live at the apollo by christmas and you're like ain't gonna happen especially not christmas yeah <laughs> you know it's just not but it's happened and you go ah, well, let's just slow down that yeah i think realistic goals and um track record and what are the red flags that people should look out for when they're trying to find an agent uh definitely over promising i think there's a lot of people not just not within the comedy industry but um agents generally who go we'll get you this we'll get you that we'll get you you don't know unless you know, something's going on we're not aware of but there is no guarantee the only promise i give to my clients that i say i cannot promise you work i can't what i can promise is i will work my ass off to get you in the doors and to try and get you those opportunities mm. i will work hard um these are the last quick fire questions yeah. uh quick fire for me you take as long as you want i normally ask this to comedians but i'm going to ask it for you um who was the first person to believe in you in the industry seamus light and why what did what's the story behind that because he 100 percent believed that i would be able to set up on my own and um would be a good agent he is a real um go-to guy actually he lives in la now manages acts over there and um if there's ever an issue pick up the phone speak to shaman cool uh what's the best show you've ever seen oh don't ask me that doesn't have to be comedy okay well i'll, I'll go with the most recent because i went on saturday i went to see jamie and okay. what show what's the show called uh, everyone's talking about Jamie. Sure, okay. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Might as well plug it. Everything. <laughs> everyone's talking about Jamie, and that was just absolutely phenomenal. Um, mm. I've not. It was really talented, talented cast. Mm. Really exciting. Yeah, I was. Go I wanted to go and see it when Phil Nichols was on, but I was touring. At I know. I'm, yeah. yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah. What a show. Yeah. Uh, what are the biggest misconceptions people have about what you do? Biggest misconceptions. I never said they'd be easy. I don't know, because they've, <laughs> they've not voiced them to me. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, unless I... I'll text John and uh, Alice. Yeah, text them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, although they probably have less misconceptions now they know you. So, yeah. yeah. No, as I said, I think if you're honest from the start, and you, you, you want to go back over it, but when you're making your plan and you go, this is what we can look at, this is what's achievable, I think, mm -hmm. in year one or whatever it is. That's not going to happen. <laughs> yeah. That is. And under promise, because then anything else is a bonus and you look good. <laughs> Who's, who said uh, un under promise and over deliver? Overachieve. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I can't, I can't remember, remember who said it, but I like it. What do you wish you were better at? What do I wish I was better at? Is this anything now? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I never said any of these were comedy related. Oh, right. Okay. I just asked how you were. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what do I wish I was better at? I don't at the moment. I'm really happy with where I'm at. One of the biggest comedy shows of the year, which we've been now told by the BBC, is airing tonight, the last episode, which is Ghosts. That's been a phenomenal success. And that group have a lot more work in them yet. That's not bad for a small independent. Mm. <laughs> Chris, just filming Would I Lie to You. We've got other things in the pipeline which I can't talk about at the moment. Every one of the acts are in a great position going forward this year. Every one of them. Confidently say that. So I'm at the right place where I should be right now. Mm. and that's only going to keep growing. Okay. Um, what is the most interesting thing that you do that nobody ever sees? Ooh. Um, I don't want to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> you had a cheeky grin in your face there. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no, no. You don't want to answer that one? No, because I'm quite private, you see, and that's why I'm not on Facebook. My Instagram is work, um, mm. predominantly. It's not... I'm not there to promote myself. I'm there to promote my business okay. and my clients. Okay, uh, then I'll ask you this one. Who do you think is the most underrated person in the industry? Oh, wow. It's not about you. This time. No, it's <laughs> just about... Um... <laughs> it can't be you as an answer now, then, is what I'm saying. Oh, gosh, there are so many talented people out there that I, I really... Not, not acts, by the way, like people behind the scenes. Oh, behind the yeah, scenes, yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Oh. I mean, you can do acts if you want, but largely I, I, I'm interested in who you think is like... Industry-wise, gosh, um, that's difficult because you know the people who run the gigs 
like, I mean, here in Top Secret, there's seven nights a week, pretty much all, every day of the year, isn't it, virtually? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I run gigs and I know what an absolute admin nightmare is. Because yeah. they run <laughs> um, four a night. I just can't, yeah, I know, I couldn't, uh, no, mm. I, well, I, I, yeah, no, I couldn't run an agency and that. I mean, it's mm. just too much. I, I think, and it's it's great that those places mm. exist now. It really is. Um, um, yeah, I, I think they're fantastic. Um, there should be an industry awards um, mm-hmm. for everybody behind the scenes. Um, what do you think is the biggest problem in the comedy industry and how would you go about solving it? I would... Ooh, no, I don't think it's unfair because I'm, I'm not picking on anybody in particular, but I think that it fascinates me sometimes that producers and bookers just don't know people on the circuit. And I've had meetings where people have just sat there looking blankly at me as I'm talking about acts. And I'm like, you, why are you not going out to see these people? <laughs> you know, how do you not know, you know, th- th- about this person who's won this award or this one? And I think there's, you know, if you are working in this industry, if your job is to give people work or to, to find people to do the, the TV shows, the radio panel shows, whatever, then you should be out there looking and not just going to the first agency that you know because your mate works there or that has the biggest names on the book. You know, that generation coming through underneath and the ones after that, they're going to be the next lot. So it should be your primary, you know, like it was mine when I was starting out. I was out every night. I, actually, I still am. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, you need to be out there. You need to be seeing what people are doing and not just following the crowd going, oh, it's him. We're going to go and watch him. Mm. Yeah, but... <laughs> Go and watch somebody else. Go and watch, you know. And I had a case not long ago with um, a comedian was telling me, no, nothing to do with any of my acts, was saying, oh, a producer had turned up, was, I think it was to this comedy store in Manchester, a producer had turned up saying, this act, I'm coming to see him tonight. Is he on first? No, no. I've seen this happen. Yeah, yeah. Can you put him on first? Because I've got to go. Because I want to go home, yeah, yeah. So when I'm dealing with producers, and it is frustrating, you go, I'll make sure he's on in the first half. And really... Shouldn't be the case. They should be seeing everybody, but you know, time is yeah. Mm. It's frustrating. That that's something I would change. That if you're going to be working in this industry, <laughs> go out. No, go yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. It's, it's one of the most social jobs possible. I would have thought. You know. Sort of. Well, yeah. It's, it's one of the most you're out every night jobs, not necessarily yeah. sociable. No, no. Yeah. Fine. Last question: uh, If you could give one bit of advice to I don't know a few thousand comedians that will listen to this who are looking for an agent, what would it be? I think pick somebody that you like, pick somebody that you want to work with and somebody that shares your goals, as I said earlier, and that you, you communicate well with. I think that's the most important thing. It's, it, it, this is a tough, tough business and um, you just don't need to be fighting your, <laughs> your agent. You know, you've got to get on. Definitely. Well, thank you very much for coming on. Thanks, Harmon. Cheers. No worries. That was Jacob. Oh, Mm, hearing about how proactive he is about all of his clients' careers and his thoughts on quotas and how the people that he is representing are being represented. Oh, I, I got so much knowledge out of this and I think he does amazing work. As always, I would love it if you took a minute to say thank you to him. I've put a link to his Twitter in the show notes so you're able to go and send him a thank you message. There's, uh, there's also mine in there if you'd like to tag me and I would really appreciate any and all positivity that you could send my way. I really love putting these together but I also love knowing that you've enjoyed them. So if you have enjoyed this one or any episode, please thank the guests. I can't tell you how much that actually supports this project and keeps it going. Other ways you can support the project to keep it going. Look at that. That was like real radio. That was like a real seamless, like I ruined it by acknowledging it. But anyway, other ways you can support this podcast is by coming to see me in Edinburgh. My show is called Every Room Becomes a Panic Room When You Overthink Enough. It is at the Sweet Venues Grass Market at 8.35 p.m. Uh, if you want to find the link easier, it's in the show notes. I uh, might... <laughs> My mouth is bored of saying it already. That is a bad sign for the flyering I've got to go and do when I'm up there. I am genuinely bored of plugging the show. Um, just buy a ticket. Like at this stage, if you don't know I'm going to Edinburgh, um, I can't. I, you're not gonna. You know, you're not gonna know, are you? Or come. So, but just come, please do. If you're in Edinburgh, you can spare a fiver and an hour of your life. Just come and watch it. That'd be really appreciated. If you're not coming to Edinburgh, please, that came off a bit more whiny than I was expecting, but you. I've been sat in an edit suite trying to get podcasts 
scheduled ahead of time so I've like recorded about five or six of these in a row and I'm just bored of saying it I know I know individually that came off more whiny than it should have done but I'm leaving it in because I can't be bothered to make it again if you've enjoyed this episode uh, you might also like episodes with Charlotte Austin who is from Austin Management or Catface Management as it used to be called that was when I interviewed her um, and I also did a podcast I did a panel with three agents about two years ago at the Edinburgh Fringe so if you want to hear those guys having a chat about their thoughts on the industry in Edinburgh have a listen to that one next Um, thank you very much for all your time and for enjoying this episode if you're new here please do not forget to hit subscribe if you're old here please do not forget to give us an honest ideally positive review in iTunes five stars would be amazing and if not a four star that reads like a five is just as good and either way please do join the Facebook group it's called RC Industry Podcast and it's on Facebook obviously the RC Industry Podcast is a fruit that got in gravity's way production for the internet all elements were created by me comedian Simon Kane thank you very much for listening Thank you very much for subscribing and thank you very much for rating and donating if you do and coming to see me in Edinburgh. I'll see you all in about 14 days time or at the fringe if you come sooner. Bye.